Thank you for tuning in for this week's Sunday School lesson. Uh, it's on Daniel. We've been talking about Daniel the last couple weeks and we're going to continue for the next three or four weeks. Daniel was a very inspiring character in the scriptures and we can learn a lot from the life of Daniel and the people and the, um, you know, his friends that came with him and also the people that they had to interact with, the various kings of Babylon and Persia. So we'll get started on that and we'll look at a few things and hopefully we can brighten up your day and challenge you to live a closer walk with the Lord. So let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for caring about us. Thank you, Father, for just being with us and knowing that you give us strength when we need it and you give us faith when we need it and you give us mercy when we don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your love and for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you'll turn with me to uh, Daniel, uh, we're in chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. And we're going to talk about King Belshazzar today. Now, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar we talked about in chapter 2, and he was one of the first kings of Babylon. And as time went on, we're getting to the very end of Babylon's reign as a major power. And the last king that reigned there was named Belshazzar. He actually is technically not a king. He was kind of a vassal of the king of that particular region. But he was too busy uh, on military escapades and building temples and building buildings and just doing other things. And so he was not around as much as he should have been. And so he turned it over to uh, to, to Belshazzar. Now, uh, that king's name was Nabonidus, Nabonidus, but it didn't really make any difference. You're not going to remember that anyway. It's not important. But the important thing is to know that Belshazzar was the one who was king at this time. Because when you look at the various uh, chapters in Daniel and the various verses, you see that he deals with different kings at different times. And we know that right after this particular lesson, uh, Babylon falls to Persia, and so David uh, Daniel's going to be dealing with the Persian kings after this. So just kind of put that into perspective. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, it says, King Belshazzar had a great feast for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine in their presence. Under the influence of the wine, Belshazzar gave orders to bring in the gold and silver vessels that his predecessor Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, wives, and concubines could drink from them. So they brought in the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, wives, and concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised their gods made of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Okay, so let me, let me just kind of back up a little bit and put this into some historical perspective. You remember I told you uh, before that the uh, Israel or J Judah, um, the 12 tribes were split into two kingdoms, basically the 10 northern tribes known as Israel and the two southern tribes known as Judah. So the 12, uh, so, so the, the 10 northern tribes, they were invaded by Assyria and taken into captivity in like 722 B.C., uh, it wasn't, and the reason why the southern kingdom, Judah, the, the two tribes down there were not taken into captivity is because they agreed to a truce and they became a vassal state or a vassal country to the Assyrians. But then the Babylonians overtook the Assyrians and became a world power. And during that time, the two southern kingdoms, known as Judah, thought they would be able to revolt and rebel and be free. And so they did. But it didn't work out. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came down and destroyed the temple, took the uh, gold, the, the chalices, the bowls, the vessels, all the things that were in the temple that were used to worship God. And he took them all back to Babylon along with a lot of the people. And that happened in 586 or 587 B.C. Uh, and so Babylon was the country at this time. They had taken a lot of... Uh, people, uh, Hebrews, Israelites, etc., from these kingdoms and it, and it transported them to Babylon, which is what, uh, you know, a lot of nations did at that time, especially Babylon. That's what they did. They liked to bring people, the resources, the best they could get from other places and bring them into their land. They uh, had 
uh, that's why they took Daniel and his three friends in because they looked uh, kind of the cream of the crop and they wanted to to um, prepare, prepare them for leadership positions in Babylon. But a lot of them, they just would take up for slaves. That was, you know, a, a big deal. And we talk about slavery in America. That wasn't anything new. Slavery has gone on in the world uh, ever since the world began almost. And it continues even now in other countries. So slavery was something that was just accepted. Uh, if you lost, you, you just expect to be taken into slavery, etc. Not that that's a good thing or anything else, but um, but but it, it's not unusual. Sometimes people think the only slavery that took place was in America, but it, it had been going on. And even today, there's countries that have slaves. So if you look then at what we're talking about here, we see that uh, Nebuchadnezzar overthrew the temple, uh, wiped out the Hebrews, de de deported them to Babylon, and he got all of these vessels and stuff and brought them with him. Well, after a while, he died, of course. Uh, and uh, about 25 years later, uh, King Belshazzar took over. And uh, we're going to see some of the problems that he had and how Daniel helped his situation. So this is where we get the infamous, the handwriting on the wall. So it says, at that moment, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and began writing on the plaster of the king's palace wall next to the lampstand. As the king watched the hand that was writing, his face turned pale, and his thoughts so terrified him that he soiled himself and his knees knocked together. The king shouted to bring in the mediums, Chaldeans, and diviners. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this inscription and gives me its interpretation will be clothed in purple have a gold chain around his neck, and have the third highest position in the kingdom. So all the king's wise men came in, but none could read the inscription or make its interpretation known to him. Then King Belshazzar became even more terrified. His face turned pale, and his nobles were, nobles were bewildered. You remember kind of the same thing happened with Nebuchadnezzar. He could not get the, the, the dream that he was trying to figure out what was going on. He called in different people to help him out. Uh, and finally, Daniel interpreted his dream. And when he interpreted his dream, uh, it, um, it, it affected the king, Nebuchadnezzar, so much that it said he walked in the fields like an animal. And you can read that in the scriptures and was reduced to less than human. And it was through this time that he got his sense back, that he, feel, uh, that he figured out what he was doing that was wrong. And he uh, somewhat repented. He did not become a God-fearer necessarily. He did accept Daniel, and he accepted Daniel's God, but he did not necessarily turn to that God and worship him. But he was uh, a, a, enough happened to him that he was shocked into reality that Daniel's God was the God, the true God, the important God. And so, even though he turns attentions on that God uh, and became better, and he became, he ended up being one of the better kings that that uh, Babylon uh, had. Uh, he he turned from his arrogance and his egotism, and he let the hand of God help him in his life through Daniel. Um, and so this is going on now again, and this is through Belshazzar, and he's having the same problems. He's trying to figure out what's going on, and he sees this hand that writes on the wall. Now, we use this today even, this, this, this term. Uh, well, he saw the handwriting on the wall, which means... It, the message he saw was a message of doom, and and he or, he or she knows that the end is coming, and that's what that's where we get that because the the message that was placed on the wall, and we'll look at it a little closer. Uh, d d d d what it's going to do is to depict the end of time, the end, the end of problem. It, it, it's going to end the reign of King Belshazzar, and also going to end the reign of Babylon. So we'll go to verse ten. And then we'll look at some of the lessons that we get from this. Because of the outcry of the king and his nobles, the queen came to the banquet hall. Uh, May the king live forever, she said. Don't let your thoughts terrify you or your face be pale. There's a man in your kingdom who has a spirit of the holy gods in him. In the days of your predecessor, he was found to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods. Your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, mediums, Chaldeans, and diviners. Your own predecessor, the king, did this because Daniel, the one who the king named uh, Belteshazzar, 
remember we talked about that. His name was Daniel, but they renamed him a uh, Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. Uh, was found to have an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and intelligence, and the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems. Therefore, summon Daniel, and he will give the interpretation. So he asked the question, why didn't uh, King Belshazzar not know about Daniel? Well, he wasn't interested in the people of the kingdom. King Nebuchadnezzar raised Daniel up to a very high level because of what he did as far as interpreting his dreams and helped him along the way. But 25 years have passed, and now the new king doesn't really know about Daniel, doesn't care about Daniel, is interested in parties and having a good time. He's not even interested really in preserving his kingdom because Persia and the Medes are building their strength, and they soon are going to overtake the Babylonian Empire. So it just, just, it just out of arrogance and egotism, he didn't know who, da who Daniel was. But uh, Nabonus' wife knew. Now, it said here, uh, his wife, the, well, it just said the queen. Remember, the, the real king was, uh, Nebu, uh, as I've said already, was Nabonidus. Um, so that, that's who the queen was. And she told uh, Belshazzar that she could, that, that he, he could get help by bringing Daniel uh, up and above and asking him to interpret what the, script, what the uh, word said because in Nebuchadnezzar's life, Daniel was a big help to him. Um, so anyway, um, we uh, stop there, and that's verse 12. And then your lesson doesn't pick up until verse 17. But the verses that were missing there is that Daniel was summoned to the king, and he asked Daniel to tell him what the writing on the wall meant. And he said that if you, if you do these things, if you're able to tell me, I'll give you all of these rewards, a cloak and a... a necklace of gold and, and etc all these prizes and all these privileges and here's daniel's response in verse 7 17 it says then daniel answered the king you may keep your gifts and give your rewards to someone else however i will read the inscription for the king and make the interpretation known to him your majesty the most high god gave sovereignty greatness joy and majesty to your predecessor nebuchadnezzar so, so uh, Daniel is introducing himself to uh, Belshazzar, and he's saying, you remember Nebuchadnezzar, and God gave him and rewarded him some, some gifts in, uh, in a long life because he listened to what I told him, and he got rid of his arrogance and his egotism, and he was willing to put God first in his life and to do what Daniel said that his God told him to do. And so Daniel says, and because he did that, he received greatness, glory, and majesty, all these things. Because of the greatness he gave him, nations and languages were terrified and fearful of him. So this great power that Nebuchadnezzar came up with, he, he was so successful as a world power and had strong armies that people were terrified of him. Um, he killed anyone he wanted and kept alive anyone he wanted. He exalted anyone he wanted and humbled anyone he wanted. So he pretty much had control of anything that he wanted to do. But when his heart was exalted and his spirit became arrogant and was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken from him, he was driven away from people. His mind was like an animal's. He lived with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like cattle and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until he acknowledged that the most high God is ruler over human kingdoms and sets anyone he wants over them. So Daniel is uh, prefacing his role to uh, Belshazzar, and he's saying, you know, you need to be like Nebuchadnezzar, and look what happened. God exalted him over all these things because he listened to what he had to say. And even though that he, you know, could, you know, was uh, violent and he could bring war on anybody and defeat any country or any nation he wanted to, uh, God touched his life and he became uh, a changed man. He uh, w w went out and acted like a wild animal for a while until his, he uh, regained his wits, etc. But anyway, we see that God was worked in his life, even though Nebuchadnezzar was not, uh, you know, really a God-fearing man, put it that way. He was not like the Hebrew people. Uh, God can use other people and work in other people's lives. God can work in non-Christians' lives. He can change their lives. Even if they're not a Christian, God can work with them, and he can help develop them as the Holy Spirit deals with them. And hopefully, all of that, with our example, as Daniel shows here, uh, will overcome their, their shortcomings, and they will 
um, be very useful in the kingdom of God. Um, so in, anyway, so, so we, we kind of see what's going on here now. So, so Daniel has talked to uh, Belshazzar. He's told him what God has done for Nebuchadnezzar. And now he's going to tell him about the dream. Uh, verse 22, he says, but, but to you, his successor, Belshazzar, you've not humbled your heart. And, and though you knew all of this, instead you have exalted yourself against the Lord of the heavens. The vessels from the house were brought to you and you, your nobles, wives, and concubines drank from them. And you praised the gods made of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or understand. But you have not glorified the God who holds your life breath in his hand and who controls the whole course of your life. Therefore, he sent the hand and this writing was inscribed. So, so Daniel is saying really what God says to us, that God holds our lives in his hands. He can do with us what he wants. He's given us free will. And so he allows us to do with our lives what we want. But he's there and he can intercede for us. He can make, he can change things. Uh, he can give us hope when there's no hope. He can perform miracles where there seems like there's no hope or it's an impossible situation. So there are a lot of things that God can do through the Spirit. Now, I'm not saying that if you have a terminal disease and you go to God and ask him to heal you from that disease, that he will. I'm not saying that because if I said that, then you would say, okay, well, I did that. I prayed that I would be healed and I wasn't. Therefore, there must not be a God. That's not how God works. God gave you free will, and because of free will, we have sickness and disease, and it just comes upon us, and there's nothing we can do about it. That's the way it is. Because of sin, we have let um, sin in, in, into the world. We have let evil into the world. We have let darkness into the world, and it affects us both physically, spiritually, emotionally, and every other way. Uh, because of free will, we have um, a, a, a people who prey on young children. We have murderers. We have... Um, thieves. We have people who, who, you know, steal, people who don't care about other people, people who usurp other people's authority and they get into the, the, the uh, limelight of power and they want to take over everybody's lives and they want to put themselves first and put everybody else second. And because of that, a lot of countries have fallen because people have, the leaders have put themselves and the, um, uh, money that they're in, interested in and uh, they want to invest all this into their own lives and make a bunch of money and they don't care about the other people, uh, their servants, the people who they're supposed to protect and watch over. And so we have all of this because of free will. Uh, you have people who you know, get mixed up in drugs, who become alcoholics, uh, who, you know, we, uh, you just, just look at the Ten Commandments, who steal, who kill, who commit adultery, who covet other people's goods, and who bear false witness against others, who don't keep the Lord's day holy, who use God's name in vain, who don't worship God like they should. And so we have uh, all of these commandments. They don't honor their parents. We have all of these commandments that are broken, even though that was a covenant between us and God. The, uh, we, don't, we don't hold that covenant. We decided that we're going to do our own thing, and that's called sin. And so um, he's trying to tell, Daniel's trying to tell him that you are in that predicament because of your own uh, free will. You have not listened to God, to his voice in your life, and you've done things that make you happy and make you, that bring you pleasure and don't really amount to anything after all is said and done because God holds, which is important. God's the one that holds your life, your kingdom, the way that you live in his hands. And he can make changes for you if you'll let him and he'll help you to be a better person. So that's what Daniel uh, is is basically telling him. That's that's what he's saying. He said it, it worked for Nebuchadnezzar, and it could work for you. So let, let's look here at just a, a few things that that people get involved in uh, when they let their free will be overtaken by themselves and put those things first. So let me push this, pull this board in here. First of all, we become, we think that we are the center of the world. We think that we're the center of the world. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that feel that way. And you may have felt that way before at times. And you felt that you didn't owe anybody anything and you didn't have to answer to anybody. But that's not the case. There's always somebody better than you in every kind of situation, sports, business, teaching, 
um, being a pastor, being a minister, there's always somebody better than you, somebody who does a better job than you do. And, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. That's just the way it is. But, but you're not the center of, of the world. You're not the most important person in the world. You need to humble yourself and put other people before you. And that's one of the things that Daniel is trying to tell the king, that you need to quit throwing these wild parties and quit having this uh, immorality going on and instead worship me and lift me up. Uh, and then secondly, uh, one thing that we do is, is we ignore God. When people get into those situations, they ignore God. Now just think about that. How many people that you know of that are successful ignore God? More people ignore God than don't. There are some people who are successful and they give God the credit and they repay him by repaying and helping other people, um, by being good citizens, by being a good friend, by being a good Christian. But there are a lot of people who don't. They think, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm going to ignore God because I know what's best for me and I've made all this on my own and God had nothing to do with it. He didn't give me any help whatsoever. And that's what Belshazzar said. He said, I, I you know, everything I have, I've earned, I, I have it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to bring all of these, uh, I have all these parties, bring all these parties to the palace, have all these parties, etc. And Persia that night was at his very gates getting ready to invade, but he was having a drunken brawl with over a thousand people there. So people uh, ignore God whenever they get into these situations where they think that they're the center of the world. They, uh, they, they Then the next step is that they ignore God. Uh, and then, let me move this back just a little bit. And then they, um, they uh, act immoral. They become immoral. And what that simply means is that they don't honor God any longer. They honor themselves. And they, they do things that bring pleasure to them, whatever it may be, in a sexual connotation, uh, in stealing money from other people and being dishonest, uh, whatever it may be, they become immoral. They start looking at themselves as being above sin. And that's what happens. And then, then lastly, uh, is they mock God. They mock God. So these are the things that happen whenever individuals put themselves over God and they think that they know more than God knows and they become successful. And here, here's what happens uh, step by step. And finally, they mock God, just like the Babylonians did by uh, using the uh, instruments that they stole from the temple, that they brought from the temple, which were uh, blessed to God, honored to God, given to God for his for a particular temple worship. And now they're using it. It says the prostitutes, the concubines, the maidens, the um, uh, you know, politicians, people who are there are all drinking of them uh, in, in kind of a sense that they're mocking God, the God of the temple, the God of Israel. And so Daniel sees all this and he knows what's going on. And so he is looking into this and he's going to tell them now, the King Belshazzar, what, what the writing on the wall means. Uh, it's, and he says, this is the right, and it said that whenever uh, Belshazzar saw this, his knees knocked together and he even soiled himself. It, it shook him up so bad, but he there wasn't even an interpretation given yet. So now Daniel's going to interpret it, and I wonder how he felt after he heard this. It says, this is the writing, this is verse 25, that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the message. So, so this is what uh, Daniel was saying. Mene means that God has numbered the days of your kingdom. Uh, Mene is a, a word, uh, the, a uh, Babylonian word, uh, and, and it meant numbered. And so he said, this means that God has numbered the days of your kingdom. Uh, tekel means that you have been weighed on the balance and found deficiency. Tekel means weight. And the idea here is, uh, you know, the scales where you put the product that you're selling on one side of the scale, the old kind of scales that were in balance, and then you would put weights on the other side, and then you know how much they weighed. And so he said, so so you're being weighed. Your 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 kingdom, your your lifestyle, you as a person is being weighed against the qualities that God expects, and you have been found deficient. And third, Paris means that your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and and uh, and Persians. Okay, so what that means there, Paris means half, and so it means that your kingdom is going to be destroyed, half of it to the Persians and half of it to the Medes. 
Though these were the two countries that were bring, uh, pressing upon Babylon. Um, the uh, Persians and Medes joined together uh, not too long after this invasion, and they became one strong force of the Persians. And they're the ones that uh, invaded the Greeks and all this stuff, and, and they were finally defeated by Alexander the Great. So anyway, uh, it's so, so then it says, so Belshazzar gave the order, and they clothed Daniel in purple. I, I can't believe that he even did this because of the bad news that he got. But he said he was going to do this, and he did carry it out. He gave him a gold chain around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And then verse 30 says, That very night Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was killed. Uh, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom at the age of 62. So things happen really fast, don't they? Now, that's, that's uh, imp interesting to see here, that Babylon was overthrown that very night. And we know that this happened because it is, it's, it's historical. It is in other writings and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, tablets and uh, scrolls and other things that we see about the history of the time. And we know that the Persians overtook Babylon on this particular day. And so uh, we see here that God's uh, word, his truth is correct and that Daniel was correct, and that he was able to identify what God wanted him to do. So let's look at just a few things uh, that we can learn from this. First of all, we can speak the truth. Speak the truth. Now, you know, it was probably pretty hard for Daniel to speak the truth because he knew it was going to get him in trouble, but he spoke the truth anyway, and it didn't get him in trouble. In fact, Belshazzar uh, rewarded him for it. He didn't listen to what he said. He ended up uh, keeping his party going on, and and he he lost his kingdom that night. It was too late anyway. By the time Daniel told him what the word said, uh, so anyway, uh, speak the truth. You know, there, there's going to be times in your life where you're going to be facing other people, and maybe they'll be gossiping about somebody, or maybe they'll ask you about something, uh, or maybe they'll uh, you know be people who think that. Well, you can live any way you want to, and you're still going to go to heaven. Um, and then you get a chance to talk about that. Now, don't be afraid to speak the truth. Um, my mother-in-law was in the hospital a long time ago, and she was there with the lady. And the lady was talking to her about all the affairs that she had and all the boyfriends she had. And was really uh, 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 um, gloating about it, etc. And my mother-in-law, she was pretty outspoken. Before she went to sleep that night, she said, that that was wrong. You shouldn't live like that. That's not what the Bible teaches, etc. And she said when she went to bed that night, this is back in the time when there were two people in each room and there are some hospitals still like that. Anyway, uh, she was afraid that she she said, I didn't know if she's going to get up and cut my throat or what, because she got quiet and didn't talk about it anymore. And the next morning she said, you know, I listened to what you said. I never really, never thought about that. I really heard that. And you're right. And and so she, you know, she changed her mind and her opinion. So you never know. Uh, secondly, is to be prepared. Be prepared to speak out whenever opportunities arise. Just like Daniel was prepared to tell the king what the dream, what his dreams meant. Now, he could have not been prepared. He could have been drunk that night. He could have been out, uh, you know, uh, carousing around, not really doing what he should be doing, not praying to God, not being a part of God's will. Uh, he could have been out, you know, taking care of his own interests. But he didn't. He listened to what God had to say and was prepared to do what God wanted him to do. And so it worked out better. Uh, and then a good reputation opens doors. So if you have a good reputation, people are going to come to you and they're going to give you an opportunity many times to speak. They're going to ask you your questions. They're going to ask you what you feel about certain instances because they respect you and they admire you as an individual. They may not live like you do. They may make fun of your Christianity, but deep down they know that you've got something that they don't have and that you can answer questions in the spiritual realm that they're unable to answer. And so they will come to you at times. Doors will open. You'll get opportunities to speak. And so when this does, uh, then be willing to tell the truth, to speak out, uh, and you'll get those opportunities because of your reputation as a, as, as a holy person. Uh, and then... He says to all of us to move this back just a little bit, to know better and to do better. Nebuchadnezzar knew better because Daniel told him what to do, and he actually did better. 
God tells us what to do all the time to make us better people. We can either reject it like Belshazzar or we can accept it like Nebuchadnezzar. And God wants you and he wants me to accept his word in our lives that will change us forever. And that's the great mission. That's the great uh, understanding. That's the great hope that the Bible gives to us, that the Holy Spirit en endures within us and gives to us the message of God and allows us to be a stronger person every day. So the closer you live to the Lord, the more opportunities, more opportunities you're going to get to express that to other people, whether they see it by your word or by your actions. They probably won't care much about what you say if they don't see it in your actions. So you have to not just know better, but do better. And then people will be um, uh, impressed by the way you are. I, I'm not like that. I'm not like that person, but they've got something special. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Bel Bel Belshazzar, I'm not like Daniel. Um, you know, I, I don't uh, have that same cohesiveness that he has, that same endurance that he has, that same um, motivation that he has to pray to his God and to allow God to help him in his life and to help me. They see that and they respected Daniel for it. They didn't agree with what Daniel had to say necessarily. They didn't agree with his lifestyle, but they knew he had something special. So that's one thing you can hold on to as Christian. People are always looking, they're always watching, and you always have opportunities to reach into their lives. So that's what this particular section of Daniel is telling us about. So I hope it's been helpful to you. So let's uh, close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for caring for us and for loving us and for allowing us to know that you do love us and that you stand with us. And like Daniel, you give us the words to say in Jesus' name. Amen.